We'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's having a great day today. My name is Joe Tackett. I'll be the uh, the host today. I'm going to walk uh, walk everybody through a slide deck and presentation. So thank you all for attending the webinar on innovation in Rialto, how a microgrid is building resilience into the city's wastewater treatment facility. Today's webinar is sponsored by World Circular Economy Forum which brings together forward-looking organizations to support circular economy. And what we mean when we say circular economy is a solution for industry and businesses at all scales to reduce, reuse, and recycle water and waste. On today's webinar, we will highlight the partnership between Rialto City leaders, Table Rock, and Veolia. I'm joined today's panel by this, the mayor of Rialto, Deborah Robertson, whose vision in developing sustainable solutions set this process in motion, as well as Peter Lucchetti, managing partner at Table Rock, whose firm has played a pivotal role in creating feasible financial structures for the partnership to think broadly, creatively about the community's long-term needs. I'm also proud to be joined by my colleague with Veolia, Chandra Sikar, um, better known as CV, who is a director of capital program management and will be going through details about how the microgrid solution is being um, designed and implemented. My name is Joe Tack and I'm the senior vice president for Veolia Municipal Water Group. Just a reminder before we, be, before we begin today, please submit the questions at any time in your chat box. We will dedicate time towards the end to answer as many questions as we can. So without further ado, let me turn things over to the mayor to talk to you about the origins of the project, the visions that she has produced for us. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, mayor. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone who is uh, participating. Uh, this webinar really appreciate that you're taking the time to kind of look into uh, the community of Rialto. Uh, as we get started, uh, I'm going to be going over some of the points, but I'd like to, in in helping to get some context of, of where we are talking. And if you notice that first slide that was up, that was kind of an aerial shot of Rialto. Uh, Rialto is a very somewhat of a beautiful shot. I might add with the historical church in the lower right hand corner. But Rialto is a, a, a city, a mature city. We're over a hundred plus years old. And we sit in the uh, Inland Empire area but between two large cities. Uh, some are familiar with Ontario, but Fontana is to my west and San Bernardino, the city, the county seat is to my east. We're about uh, 68 miles. I would say roughly from the Los Angeles uh, proper area in LA. And we, one of the reasons that has inspired this uh, met, uh, microgrid project is starting with some of the partnerships that uh, Joe spoke of as we started out. We entered probably back in, I wanna say 2012, maybe 2011, we started looking at a public-private partnership and entered into a concession agreement. And while I appreciate what Joe said in the introductions that I've been probably the one who has spearheaded it, it has always been with a team. I want to make sure I note that. In this city and, and me, I constantly say there's no I in team. So even though I am the designated elected official, uh, things have to get done in a collaborative effort with my colleagues. So I do want to make sure to note that they are very much been a part of this, uh, this journey. But given the historical perspective, Rialto is a city that's over 100 years old and like most cities, dealing with and addressing your infrastructure needs. We always look at uh, trying to figure out how to keep our roads going, but the system of wastewater and water plants are usually under the ground and they're not very, I'll say very attractive. Uh, most communities don't focus on it. And it requires a lot over a period of time to keep a system going up. 
Rialto is no different than a lot of other cities that are in the region that are usually 100 plus years. So people before me on council often had to make decisions and they often deferred a lot of the maintenance and operation. So we had a plant that's been uh, in existence for a while. It has had originally five plants, originally was constructed, but deferred maintenance was really putting us in a situation. So about 2000, I want to say we started it about 2012 with the, uh, the concession agreement. And we agreed that we would build a, another plant, the fifth plant. We started that construction around about 2018 and we just completed it in 2020. It's known as plant five. We spent about $31 million investment to make that happen. I uh, won't go into all the details of how we made it happen, but we did. And now that we have that, then we said, well, how are we going to ensure reliability for our customers, realizing that we're also, all of us are entering into periods of what we know as climate change, things are changing, uh, outages uh, sometimes are now more common than they uh, have been in the past. So we looked at this project, uh, the microgrid project, which uh, later on CV will be talking more in detail about it. And we brought this project on and we anticipated that if this project really accomplishes what we're hoping, our motivate, motivation for the project is that it will help to, we'd already identified that we, by building the plant, uh, the fifth plant and at the same time when we did built the fifth plant we actually decommissioned a number of the other plants we saw that we were going to save just in the construction of the plant alone about a half a million dollars in savings uh, on uh, just on operation and maintenance now that we look at this microgrid project and what we envision could be some of the benefits when it's all said and done and if it actually bears out the way we anticipate, we will be looking at roughly about $1.5 million worth of savings uh, to the existing plant and to the operation. And the microgrid project, basically what all systems is using electricity. And so we're looking at, that would be our the number one benefit and economic impact, but we also have to look at the resiliency consideration. And as I said earlier, we're experiencing not just the city of Rialto, but all throughout the region. We are, our primary server or provider of electricity is Edison. Northern California is probably, uh, I think it's DW, uh, uh, power, whatever, power, power general electric, but we have basically, they're the number one suppliers here, Southern California Edison. When we have power outages, it can be very, uh, uh, I will say, it can have its impacts and and it uh, disruptions to the operation of what we're doing. We're a city with over 100,000 plus people and we need to continue to figure out how do we build in reliability and resiliency to that operation. So we're envisioning that that will help us and so far, we've already had a feasibility study done, and we just had a discussion about that yesterday. And the feasibility study was favorable and promising to the point that we are now going to proceed to about 30% design and see if our assumptions of what we think will happen and provide us in terms of overall cost savings will be eventually realized. Um, in addition to that, environmental challenges that we talk about we we were no different but what we're hoping that the microgrid will do will help us in some opportunities to get some better uh, reliability as it relates to the regulatory matters not only in water the regional water board but also in air quality so i you know i'm a champion of uh, innovation I feel like when we are doing something, we're not only planning for the present, but going down this path is planning for uh, reliability to the future and also leaving our community in a place where they, the future generations will be able to build on it. And I don't think that it's 
the way not to go. I'm very supportive of it because I think at least it shows we're trying to take care of our own uh, destiny instead of totally being reliant on systems. So I hope uh, that gives you a nice introduction of what's going on in our community. I'm not originally from Rialto, California, but I am a California native. I was born and raised in San Diego, and I've always been around water, uh, whether in environmental issues or in ports. Uh, so this is just a natural for me. I think what we can do to really bring about uh, what we say recycle and reuse and repurpose is really what we can do with the benefits of uh, what we're doing at our wastewater treatment plant. So Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you this time. Uh, Joe, Joe, thank you. And Mayor, it's a pleasure to follow on your introduction. Um, again, I'm Peter Lucchetti and responsible for Table Rock Infrastructure Partners. We're a firm that develops concession agreements with cities. We specialize in water and wastewater, energy, and communications. We have three areas that we're working in. The, the, the genesis of, of uh, this particular partnership approach goes all the way back, as the mayor indicated, to the 2010-2012 the timeframe when we developed the original 30-year concession contract with the city. And the original contract, which noting we're now in the 10th year of that agreement and have had a really interesting and I think productive operating history with the city. Uh, the original intention and definition of the contract was to come into the city and provide uh, management of uh, water, all of the water and wastewater utility activities, including billing, billing collections and customer service. So that was the scope of the 10 year of the 30 year agreement that we're now in the 10th year of. From an operational point of view, uh, it's been very successful. Uh, we had an initial rate increase when we came into the agreement and invested a considerable amount of capital into the community, $173 million. Uh, but since that time, we've managed to carry on to the 10th year of the agreement without any additional rate increases. Uh, we've really achieved considerable operational savings and are only now looking at the next wave of capital investment, thinking about what we might do next on the financial side. But I just want to say on the financial side, I think the concessions provided a lot of um, uh, organization uh, in and around the city's utilities and provide us with a strong credit rating and, uh, uh, and future outlook. The concession contract includes, uh, I think, really important element that relates to this idea of dynamic life cycle asset management. Uh, Veolia is our subcontractor who does the actual day-to-day -day operations, and Veolia provides this service. In fact, CV, who's on with us today, is one of the members of the Veolia team who's intimate, intimately involved in this. And the idea is that we are modeling the utility on a life cycle basis, and we every year meet and ask, what do we really need to do to optimize the utility's performance over the 30-year life of the contract? And we've been doing this for a very long time, and I want to be complimentary of the mayor and other people in the city who've really gotten the hang of this, and, and, and they, really, they really work with us very closely on saying, let's take care of the utility, let's make sure we're not either over or under investing, but we, we have the right pace of investment and we have the right pace of activity going on around what we'll call dynamic life cycle asset management. Uh, it's helped us improve our, our, our utility report card, the P3 investment. You know, we've taken the utility from what probably was a D or, or worse status up into the B, B plus level, and we continue to look for areas of improvement. The last couple of things I'll say here that I think are important to the microgrid conversation are, with that background, are that we have a permanent capital project management team in place in the concession. So if the mayor says, gee, we, we, or the city says, we really want to make these improvements or we want to take on these projects, we have a way of responding to that and we have a bench strength uh, in, in order to be able to go out and do projects like the microgrid. And then what I will say about the microgrid in terms of a sustainability cha challenge in closing the carbon cycle is that as we've improved the quality of the assets through the lifecycle asset management, 
as you gain momentum and you get strength and you, you know, you, you deal with the lower hanging fruit, the, 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 the more basic projects that need to be done, you can start in the 10th year to look to more sophisticated ideas. And, it, you know, we really had dealt with what we'll call the liquid side of the plant, the hydraulic side of the plant. Uh, down at the wastewater plant, and we wanted to focus on solids and gas management. And it, it, for the longest time, we felt it was something of an opportunity because we were flaring the biogas that was being produced by the digesters at the wastewater plant. So we said, okay, we could take that gas, produce electricity. But we had, wanted to ask another question. Could we close the carbon cycle? Could we close the carbon loop and be a carbon neutral plant? And that would involve more energy than was being provided by um, the gas that was available. CV will comment on this in a minute and get into this. So we said, let's do a microgrid based on batteries and biogas and solar. And if we could put that together correctly, the goal would be to make this plant as close as possible to carbon neutral. I think we will get to carbon neutral uh, and make it uh, pay for itself so that it, you know we, we, would, we would do it by saving money. We could actually give some money back to the city and support other activities in the utility. And this is turning out to be true. I'll just close by saying, and that's the revenue generating uh, part of this opportunity. I'll close my comments by saying, for those who are into the world of procurement, we are using a method of procurement. Uh, let me first say this. When you look at our project uh, capital project team, uh, our permanent project capital team, we use many different methods of procurement to address uh, the needs of the utilities in the city over time. We've done many projects and sometimes we do design bid build, sometimes we do design build and we've done progressive design build. This particular project is being done through the method of progressive design build. And I'll just uh, turn it back over to Joe here by saying, we have found with the city for more complex projects like this, progressive design build is a very good methodology uh, it really allows the city as our partner to be shoulder to shoulder with us at the table on an open book basis. All the subcontracts are bid out. It's a very, uh, I think, um, efficient process and one that provides for a real value creation. And I, I think achieving the technical and the financial goals of the city. So I think that summarizes our partnership approach. And Joe, I'm gonna hand it back to you and have you direct us to the next uh, level of the conversation. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Peter. And you're, you're absolutely right around the uh, public-private partnership and, and the role that um, the Table Rock and, and the city play in, in that. Uh, and that along with Violi, it's been a, it's been a real success and a, and a great partnership when it comes to, you know, trying to keep the, uh, the rates down for our rate payers and also um, leading the way, I guess you could say, around our, uh, our approach here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. It's back over this time to uh, to the mayor. Mayor, you're on. You're on mute. I'm so sorry. Yes, you know, technical processes here is not my strong suit on this computer. But uh, thank you for Dick Bright sending it back over to me on the project priorities. And I think again, uh, Peter has. Um, somewhat led into what are some of the project priorities. Uh, but I would like to say for, for the city's perspective, uh, when we started as it related to the wastewater uh, infrastructure altogether, we wanted to look at it as inclusive, holistic. It's an area in our wastewater plant and the section that's designated in the city, which is the South End. It's about a 24 acre uh, uh, footprint. Uh, that we're operating in. The wastewater portion of it operates about 14 acres. And so as we started on this path, one of the things was, as we, I spoke earlier about the investment in building plant five and decommissioning, uh, I think we decommissioned about two or three or the plants, we, it was repurposed. What will we do with that real estate? And how can we, you know, bring it back and, and make sure that it has beneficial use? So, of course, the microgrid project, which you'll see a piece of uh, here shortly, will be uh, a part of that footprint. But it will not be the only thing that is down there. And we continue to look for opportunities of what else we can do. Even so, to the point that we have a responsibility in this region to participate in environmental concerns and balances and 
uh, helping with uh, various species that have been identified as uh, dangerous, whether endangered species. So we also are in the process of constructing about a 10 acre uh, lake that will be co constructed in a path that is from a old uh, dried up retention basin. That will be a part of everything that's going on and play a part. Uh, the electricity and the needs and the pumps and the relationship that we have with our county and, and the uh, EPA uh, Fish and Wildlife to do our part to protect an endangered uh, species, which I think uh, CB will speak to as well, is looking at it takes electricity. All of the operation, not only at the plant, but I was talking earlier today, we have a number of other uh, facilities that play a part and we still would be paying electricity to our primary provider, which is Southern California Edison. One of the things I didn't speak about was the role that we also play with Southern California Gas. And I think Peter briefly touched on it as we talk about the uh, flaring off and we use the gas to help heat uh, our digesters to create uh, the uh, activities of what we want to have occur in the digesters, but we have to flare that off. So what I like and I'm excited about is we will not necessarily put it, the gas back into SoCal's grit, uh, grid as a project outside of our uh, footprint, but in the area, another company is actually processing organic waste and then taking the gas and process, putting it back into SoCal's grid. We're going to capture our own gas and use it to operate uh, the our project and operate um, our gas to keep our systems running and provide whatever we need to do. So it won't be put into the grid, but it's still speaking to accomplishing, eliminating the flare and creating a, a carbon neutral situation at the plant, I think is, is you know, is, is out of, I won't say totally out of the box, but it is innovative. Uh, the, uh, you know, and, and we spoke earlier, I said climate change is an issue, climate change and the risk, and uh, we we have to plan for that. We, you know, we're not controlled that we can only plan for uh, capturing, uh, here in our area, California, I think we're always geared up for earthquakes, but we haven't really often geared up for what happens when our primary uh, electrical service goes down and not really understanding to what degree it'll go down and for how long. And if it goes down for a period of time, then it, it has a domino effect in terms of the uh, the types of treatments and things that we're using or the chemicals and things that we have to keep to keep the neutrality so we can discharge. So there are pieces and benefits in realizing that climate situations as well as external situations uh, really has to be something in the forefront. We we have here we talk about managing the energy challenge and, and that is a day to day operation. That is not, um, you know, it's not something that you can't say focus on. Uh, we look at natural disasters. I think if you're familiar with what's going on in California, uh, we have drought in one minute. Uh, then we also have extreme fires. And uh, if you've kept up with the news, sometimes even some of that stuff that uh, ends up happening also affects the operation down at the wastewater treatment plant. So the idea of microgrid just seemed like the best. It may not be the only solution, but it's a starting step. When talking about it, you know, one of the things is we'll have a cogen operation in there. And there's been some concerns uh, and and desires about cogens and how it's operating and what will happen. But all of these things have been in place a while. So we get the benefit of looking at what hasn't worked or what has been problematic and plan for that and and be you know be aware of it as we go forward. So that's the priority of of, of the city is making sure that it's one less thing we really have to worry about. Uh, having a reliable, as, as Peter said or, earlier, in the concession and in the partnership, having a reliable team of experts, subject matter experts, and then also within our own staff, 
having people who have the background. So I said it and I like to say, uh, while we're working together in a partnership and it's a good one, but the old statement is, and I believe it was from one of our, uh, one of our former presidents, I don't know, but you know, you always trust, but we verify. And I think once we all are together that you don't take offense for verifying then we move forward because we all have a, a level of trust with each other, exactly of having common interests. So, Joe, you've got it again. Appreciate it, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this this time, we're going to watch a, uh, a short video here. What are microgrids? If our panelists can mute their phones, I'll start the video. We all rely on energy to light our lives and power our worlds. But how that energy is generated and delivered is changing fast. One way that it's happening is through microgrids. The traditional centralized utility grid is a big interconnected network that takes energy from large far away energy generation plants and transmits it over long distances to consumers. As technologies and policies continue to evolve, communities and businesses can choose to supply their own energy locally by building their own microgrid. A microgrid is a group of interconnected energy users and distributed energy resources. These are energy systems that can include solar panels, batteries, wind turbines, and combined heat and power plants. This means that energy is generated closer to where it's needed. The microgrid, which can be connected to the larger central grid, can function as supplement or operate independently, providing a secure backup when there's an outage. And these distributed energy resources are all great ways to generate clean, renewable energy. Homes, businesses and buildings can become more energy independent, tapping into a flexible and reliable energy supply that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and lowers carbon footprints. And because microgrids are so efficient, they also save on energy costs. As energy becomes ever more critical in our daily lives, microgrids will enable us to shift from central power generation to local, flexible, reliable forms of sustainable power and thermal energy. So when disaster strikes, we'll still have all the energy we need to power through life. Find out how we can do this for you. Veolia, resourcing the world. All right, I'm going to turn it back over here and start our presentation again. I'm going to turn it over at this time to CV. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, Joe, and Peter uh, for the introduction. So when we were a quick background of the Rialto Wastewater Treatment Plant. Now, this is located on the south side of the city. We treat on an average of about seven, seven and a half million gallons uh, of effluent coming into the plant, coming from more than, uh, this is generated by about 100,000 plus uh, residents and spread over more than 10,000 homes and businesses. This is a three stage, it's a treatment plant. We have a primary system a secondary system and a tertiary system. What happens is the flow comes into the plant, it goes through the heavy solids and debris in the water are removed by bar screens. It goes on to the primary treatment drain and the aeration basin, and then on to the uh, gravity feeds to the secondary uh, clarifier uh, for the secondary treatment system. And after the secondary treatment system, we save it uh, in what we call the equalization basin. It's essentially a big pond, a concrete structure where we store the secondary effluent. And then we pump that secondary effluent finally through a series of uh, filters and then on for the disinfection portion, which is uh, done using sodium hypochloride and then sodium bisulfide before discharging it uh, into the Santa Ana River. So between the wastewater treatment plant and the collection system infrastructure, which uh, in from several parts of the city pump 
the effluent to the wastewater treatment plant, the plant consumes about $800,000 in energy. So that was the first value driver that we targeted to see what can we do to help achieve reductions and create value for the project. What we also have on site are two anaerobic digesters where the organic matter is broken down and anaerobic digester gas is generated. And as Amir rightly pointed out, we also sometimes have to blend natural gas in order to maintain the temperature of the flare. But eventually all the gas that is produced on site is flared using the on-site flares. So that was a second value driver uh, that we targeted to see what can we do to reduce uh, or eliminate flaring of this digester gas. I mean, definitely it's majority methane. So there is calorific value and there is value uh, in the ADG and how best to use this for some beneficial use. So that was our second value proposition that we looked at. And the wastewater treatment plant in Rialto resides in a very unique ecosystem. Like I said, once we treat the, the secondary treated effluent, we have to pump it to the filters and then on to disinfection. And when we discharge it to the Santa Ana River. Now, when the power, if there in case of a power outage, we cannot pump from the equalization basin onto the filters and uh, to the channel. So from the time the power goes out, in about 12 minutes, we start seeing extremely reduced flow of treated effluent in the Santa Ana uh, River uh, or the Santa Ana Channel. Now this Santa Ana Channel is home to an endangered species of fish called the Santa Ana suckers. They're only about, about an inch-ish um, big and they love to uh, reside in the shallow channel because that keeps them safe from the other big invasive uh, species of fishes. So in case of a power outage, in about 12 minutes, we directly start seeing an impact on the Santa Ana River, which directly threatens the habitat of the endangered Santa Ana suckerfish. So that was also a very key consideration that we looked at to see what can we do to further enhance or make this plant resilient against any kind of power outages so that we don't see this happening and we can uh, play our, or we can, we can make the Santa Ana channel kind of more resilient by ensuring continuous flow into the plant. And again, the city of Rialto wastewater plant being in the Inland Empire, we have our air quality challenges. So that was definitely another uh, value proposition uh, that we looked at uh, while deciding um, and designing uh, this project. So some more details about this. So between the plant and all the pump stations or lift stations located in the various parts of the city to convey the flow to the plant, we use about 5.5 megawatt hour of power every year. And these are the Edison bills uh, that uh, Madam Mayor and Joe and uh, Peter were referring to. We also purchase about 3.43 million standard cubic feet of gas uh, from the grid, from SoCal gas. Now what this gas is mainly used is for heating the digester sludge to maintain the temperature because the anaerobic digester has to be maintained at a certain temperature range for so that the biological process can stay active and um, it, it does not go sour. So that's what the gas is mainly used for. And we also use a very small quantity of gas in order to sometimes blend it with the natural gas, especially when the flare has to turn on and turn off uh, in case of certain uh, operating conditions. So we looked at uh, this microgrid project as a means of reducing both the power consumption and possibly eliminating the gas consumption. It's also because we we have a certain we have a, a supply of readily available anaerobic digester gas which is rich in methane and our flow is about 88 standard cubic feet per minute throughout the year. So 
the goal was to see how best to channelize or use this resource, which is currently being fled and put it to beneficial uh, reuse. So based on our preliminary analysis and the, and the design uh, phase at which we are at, uh, we identified that a 400 kilowatt generator, um, this is a combined heat and power uh, engine would, would be optimally sized to use uh, the gas that is produced on site and which will approximately meet about 50% of uh, the current plant demand. But there is also a lot of, as the mayor alluded to, this is, uh, there is also space available in the plant which can be put to beneficial use. And we looked at uh, the solar install to plug some of the gap between what the plant, plant consumes and what power can be generated uh, with this microgrid project. And we identified about 1,300 kilowatt uh, of power which can be produced in the plant. In order to further enhance the re resiliency, we also looked at a battery energy storage system of about 2,330 uh, kilowatt. Now what this battery can help achieve is it can help shave off any kind of peak demand from the plant and insulate the plant uh, and, and the associated infrastructure from any kind of punitive uh, rate structure from Edison because of very high use during high demand periods. And at the same time, any excess energy that is produced between the cogen and the solar uh, solar photovoltaic cells can be stored and used during night time and other times when there is actually a deficit in what the, the energy produced by the cogen system and the plant demands. So that so the uh, battery system would help um, help levelize, I guess, the uh, consumption and and further minimize any kind of purchase uh, from the grid. When we first looked at, uh, looked at this uh, project, we started with, um, we always thought that there was, there was a, a value proposition to be had with the microgrid project. And the first thing that uh, most people ask when it comes to any kind of uh, investment or use of digestive gases, is this going to pencil out? So we had a theory that it is going to pencil out. And so in order to further validate that, we, start, uh, we engaged the services of Source One, a Veolia company, for doing a feasibility analysis. The feasibility analysis showed that there is a positive uh, a project to be had, which is financially viable uh, and which can meet uh, and help achieve some of the value propositions being targeted by the project. And once we had determined that, then we solicited proposals from uh, design firms and ultimately selected AECOM and WM Lyles um, for a progressive design build approach to design and construct uh, this project. So AECOM, WM Lyles have provided the first big milestone, which is the basis of design report, that is a BODR, and are currently working on the 30% design and a class two estimate uh, for the project cost. At this point in time, the city will have more data and a much better uh, and more well-researched uh, insight into what this project would cost, the capital costs, the operational uh, costs, in order to make a determination uh, of the next steps for the project. Thank you. O over to you, Joe. Thank you, CV. Appreciate that. So the innovations that CV has laid out um, and just outlined for us is a direct response to the challenges being faced in the industry, municipalities, governments around the country right now. Whether you want to attribute to the climate change or not, the fact is that our weather and our climate have become more severe and more extreme over the past few years. Nowhere is it more evident than here in California, which is contending with an epic levels of drought, water shortages, wildfires that are putting huge strains on our utility and infrastructure. But by designing the, the uh, microgrid project that CV and others have laid out for you, it runs a sustainable power source. We're doing our part to truly create circular solutions for the city of Rialto energy and, and water needs. 
This is keeping with Veolia's larger mission to lead the way in digital and technical, technological innovations that support the circular economy. Besides the work we are doing here in Rialto, we are also recently unveiled the pilot program equipment by using uh, remote augmented reality digital tools to inspect the treatment facilities that we operate here in Hollister, California. Augmented reality is a catch word we use to describe digital technology that can simulate or imitate real uh, real-time conditions to provide accurate measurements or readings from a remote setting. For example, at the height of the pandemic, we were able to adopt a heightened safety protocol and ensure the safety of our employees at the plant while ensuring we could continue to conduct equipment assessments. We took advantage of Veolia's hub-grade digital solutions platform by obtaining accurate readings of the plant equipment without having to send experts to the plant on site while the pandemic was happening. From a remote location, our evaluators used technologies such as the ultrasound or thermal imaging to measure equipment readings at the plant, successfully identifying areas where the maintenance or repairs were required and needed to ensure a customer that the plant was continuing to operate as smoothly as possible. Mayor Robertson, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to you for some final thoughts about the project, perhaps how it benefits the people who live and work in your community. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Um, I think uh, the information that we've provided has definitely been uh, beneficial. When we talk about the multifaceted challenges that Rialto faces along with any local jurisdiction. And we, you know, while we're, a, as I said, over 100,000, we're viewed as a, a community that is not a small community, uh, we're medium sized. And so there's so many of them throughout California and of course through America. You know, I, I always kind of go again with, with my colleagues and all of us is first look at the challenges, you know, you you start focusing always every day to control what you can within your responsibility and plan for ex external challenges. But what's within your responsibility and your jurisdiction, but you also then have to plan for the external challenges, which you may not be able to uh, totally control. And so I think that's kind of a general position we take about multifaceted challenges. The, we're speaking to you about the operation of wastewater treatment. Like I said, it's not usually the most, um, we just said uh, yesterday, it's not sometimes the, 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 the trendy thing that's first and foremost on the minds of our residents until you start having uh, systems back up. Uh, we have water and wastewater and we start having water reliability ch challenges that we have to deal with. So I'm excited and always happy that the team that I work with, um, my uh, colleagues would be in, and I take the time to announce them as Mayor Pro Tem Ed Scott, he and I probably have been uh, with this and with these concerns of, uh, of our infrastructure, our water and our economic uh, destiny probably the longest. We've also have uh, a may, uh, council member, Rafael Trujillo. He's been on a while and council member Andy Carazelis, as well as our newest member, council member Carla Perez. Do we talk about bold leadership? Well, if you look up Rialto, you're going to find out that Rialto might be called the little engine that can and will and could. We, uh, we've kind of decided, and I'm, I'm really happy about it. We've decided that, you know, there's times when we can go in a collaborative effort with our colleagues, and there's times when we may need to just chart our own destiny. I think when we decided to do public-private partnership and the team that we're working with, if you heard in the beginning, it is when I first started, we were talking about entering into Rialto Utility Authority, and it was a 30-year plan. And I thought, wow, I can't, as a, a sitting elected official, be making a decision that's going to go 30 years out. 
Now it seems to be, since having been here now 20 years, it seems to be a, a path that you want to set and make sure that it's consistent with the community and the directions we want to go and stay ahead of things rather than plan only for what's in front of you. So that's what I see with us in bold leadership. We've had a lot of challenges in Rialto, but rather than stick our, put our head, heads in the sand, we, we've tackled them and we've tackled them together. Innovative solutions, uh, it's just natural. Uh, we are, if you see our, uh, our city shield, it says we are the city with the bridge to progress. Well, for me, progress does not mean standing still. It just is so need to look at innovation and embracing. I'm happy to hear what Joe said about the things that are available under the Viola uh, structure because data analytics is the way we're going. Data aggregation, gathering data and making the best intelligent decision that you can make. And that, if that's what we call innovation, well, then that is innovation. Being strategic with our partners. Uh, and I spoke to that earlier and I, you know, I think we all bring something. They bring the, the background, the knowledge, the, uh, the subject matter, and we bring exactly what we want to see for our residents and for our community. And all we all can do, I, again, Rialto is not just a little island. Mitigating against climate change, I, I said, I remember when we weren't even believing that there was such thing as climate change. I don't think we have to go over that debate and argument anymore now. We, we are seeing floods that we haven't seen, tornadoes and hurricanes that weren't once occurring, and, uh, and you know, even just total usage, overuse of, of electricity that we relied on. So I'm happy to have been have given the opportunity to present with uh, the team that ha we have here, uh, Peter and CB and Joe, because like it or not, wherever we are, wherever we happen to be, we're all in this together. And that's what, uh, looking for common goals, looking for common decisions and finding common ground. That's kind of what I always say, you know, we may not always agree and we can agree to disagree, but of, of citizens and this, this country, we got to focus on finding common ground. So Joe, I don't know if you're going to have a... Yeah, we'll, we'll start up, Mayor, a Q&A real quick. Uh, for, for the reminder for attendees, uh, please type your questions in the chat box at this time. And we do have a couple questions that have come in right now, and I'll get to those uh, immediately here. Would there be any opportunity to bring students into the conversation? See, we all ask you that question. And Absolutely. <laughs> for, for sure, uh, we, we would love to host them. We have had uh, several tours uh, of our wastewater treatment plant, and we are proud to showcase uh, the role uh, that the real to wastewater treatment plant plays in sustaining our environment. So absolutely, yes. And I would... And, I would like to echo on that as well, Joe, that we always encourage us. CB will tell you, I have students that uh, have been on the tours with me on the various things out there. And one of our students uh, at the time, he was a senior, uh, his name was Kenneth Ha, huh? and Kenneth was excited. He worked on, the pro worked on some of the projects down there in the area. He was in high school, now uh, Kenneth is off at Stanford pursuing uh, his law degree in environmental, uh, uh, the ultimate goal to be an environmental uh, attorney. So, and we have internships, uh, try to work in partnership with our, our school district and also uh, with our university. So I've encouraged uh, a number of students. I was just at Cal State San Bernardino a week ago and I offered the opportunity for them to come and be a part of this. Sure. All right, the next question that we have, um, do you feel the cost savings from the microgrid will reduce the need for future rate increases? Peter, I'll turn it over to you. What, sorry, Joe. I said I'll, I'll turn that one to you. Yeah, um, I, I, I spent probably spend the most time of anybody on the team looking at the financial side of the utilities. 
and I want to say yes, it's not the sole driver of all of our savings, but it's a substantial driver of savings. And since we started the concession in 2012, we haven't had a rate increase in wastewater to date. And based on what we believe will be a successful microgrid project, combined with some other measures we're taking to increase savings, we do not anticipate another rate increase in wastewater for five more years. We will be 15 years into the concession at a minimum before I think we'll revisit this question. And hopefully then we'll have other sources of savings. We'll see how it goes. But right now, I think it's quite... Uh, uh, honestly, quite impressive what's been achieved uh, so far. And I you know, would say, again, it's very important to emphasize what the mayor and Joe and CV have been saying. It takes a lot of collaboration and, and cooperation between the city and Veolia and ourselves at Table Rock to um, you know, get, get down to the bottom line here and make this happen. And it, it really is a team effort. Thanks, Peter. Next question, will the system be fully automated? How much operator time will be required? CV, I'll turn that one to you. Sure, this, this, the plan is to optimize this to the greatest extent possible um, and see what value we can create by remote monitoring, but there will definitely be some additional operator uh, involvement uh, in this and which we, we are very keenly looking and pricing it in because that's definitely a part of the operational cost, uh, which plays into the overall financial viability of this. So it's, it's going to be a mix of both, um, some remote monitoring, long-term service agreements, as well as boots on the ground to maintain uh, the, the uptimes and to maintain the system. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you, CV. Uh, let's see here. The next question: um, Can we get regular updates on how the progress is going? Uh, I guess I'll ask the mayor that question. You know, that's a good question. Good question, and I would say yes. I I think we have a subcommittee water subcommittee that we meet uh, monthly and as we move along we should be uh, providing an update through our uh, monthly city manager report that we put out to the community and i would assume that also in our partnership that uh, veolia also could give us continue to give us a, a status update so that's uh, possible and actually it, it, I'm glad for the question because we could probably even set a site for putting it on a website so that people could just click on and see the status update of what's going on. Absolutely. And Madam Mayor, we also provide updates about uh, the microgrid and all other capital projects during the monthly uh, utilities uh, uh, committee meeting. And of course, uh, any, any members of our public are welcome to attend. Yes, you're right. Uh, the meetings are open. They're open to the public and they are published, uh, noticed in advance of when the meeting is occurring. So there's many ways, uh, you know, that they can either go for print or take the opportunity to make us aware that they would like to uh, sit in or join in or make a request. We, we, we have a um, woman, Megan Madsen, on the Table Rock Infrastructure Partners team who runs the project in the, in, so to speak, in the top box and reports to the mayor and the mayor pro temp directly on the project. I just wanted to add that to the storyline. I, I think she's an expert in progressive design build and uh, knows a lot about microgrids and this whole conversation. In fact, one of the other questions I thought was interesting about, um, uh, about uh, uh, automation we are moving, as TV said, to continuous gas and solids management so we can produce electricity 24-7 on, a, on a, a steady and reliable basis. So there's just a lot of cool things going on in this project, and I would encourage what the mayor and CV has said. There's a, you know, we, we are tend to be very open and very cordial, I think, uh, our team, and would welcome uh, further dialogue with anybody who wants to have it. And just to follow up with what Peter said, Joe, uh, this is a laboratory and this is a test i mean this this we're going to get this right but peter's aware that i have a, even a grander 
picture of how we can take this outside of our footprint and hopefully offer this to some of our surrounding business community and have a some way of a bigger collaborative where we all are feeding back into a grid, making these types of uh, situations so that they all can have that level of reliability, not only on, on the wastewater side, but just expanding that footprint. We're in a, you know, we're in an area that I see it much larger. I have uh, industrial commercial surrounding the area. And I just think that it would be awesome if you could find an area within a specific plan that we've already designated that we could somehow tr transfer and partner outside of uh, our own uh, 24 acre footprint. So I know Peter well, will uh, talk about it. <laughs> I, I certainly <laughs> wanted to tell you, Mayor, that we, we've had this conversation a number of times and we're very excited about the idea of taking the microgrid concept over the wall of the plant into the community. For those of you who aren't familiar with Rialto, it is one of the critical, it sits right in the center of the city of one of the most critical transshipment and logistics uh, hubs in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, the, you'll see the largest warehouses in the world here uh, with nothing on the roofs. And it just makes enormous sense to start producing power on those roofs and changing the character of energy in the community at large, both from a, a local generation point of view, carbon free. Uh, you know, the mayor's got a great vision. We really support the vision and expect to go over the wall. I think the mayor's committed and we're committed. I think what we want to do is make this work, get, 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 you know, you walk before you run, and then we want to go over the wall and we want to really do something really powerful for, for Southern California. And frankly, we think it would be a, a project of national significance in the country to go over the wall and start producing a large amount of distributed energy in this community that is complementary to what our utility does and works with our community choice aggregation entities. Uh, Mayor, I think you got a great vision. We support you. So we got time for one last question here. For, and I apologize. We have a tremendous amount of questions coming in in the chat room, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one more here real quick. For someone who might be considering this kind of microgrid project at their own facility, what do you think the first thing they'll need to do is on their own in order to have an informed conversation about how to move forward? Uh, let's give that one to CV. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Uh, CV, we got about 45 seconds here. Good. The first thing is that I, I think, you know, look within. What, what are your power consumption? How much are you spending annually on power, on natural gas? What are some of the other economic outlays? Because ultimately, this also has to make a business case for you. Secondly, what are, what are some of the assets that you have in-house which can be leveraged to help offset some of these costs? Is, it, is there anaerobic digester gas? Is there any footprint for solar? Uh, are there some other unique things for the plant which can which can be monetized or which can be put to uh, the productive use? So those are the first step. And I would definitely uh, welcome any conversation and please feel free to call us and we can we can take a look at this and come up with a structure uh, for, for this thought process and see what is out there and how can it be used. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time today and joining us. Um, hopefully everyone has a great week. If you have any questions, we'll get an email out to all the attendees today with some uh, email addresses on there so that you can uh, continue to ask questions. I'll continue to answer those in the chat room as well. Um, my my uh, email address is joseph.tackett at veolia.com. Um, Peter, you want to give yours real quick? Uh, yeah, I, it's Peter at TableRockPartners.com. Peter at TableRockPartners.com. And we would welcome a conversation with anybody who wants to have it. Uh, and just closing out what CV is saying, you should, if you want to procure, you should talk to Megan Matson about how this process works. I think she's got a really good handle on the process. And as I said, she reports the mayor and the mayor pro tem, and I think they're happy with it. Um, it's, it's a very, it takes a lot of, I think it takes a lot of experience to be able to what I call meet in the middle of what 
the private sector drives in the process and what the public sector and the mayor and the mayor pro tem need to manage their side of the business. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance and one I think we do pretty good at. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks, Peter. Mayor, I'm gonna, I'm gonna refrain from giving your email address out here unless you want to. Hey, it's, it's public information. It's D Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N, at RialtoCA.gov. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. CV? Oh, this is going to be a tough one. I don't know. <laughs> CV, if you are okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll just keep mine out there for now. CV. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Have a great week. And uh, like I said, we'll get an email out to everyone with some contact information on there and get your questions answered. Thank you. We're closing now. Thank you, co-presenters.